Hello, my name is Miss Ginger. I am a sixth and eighth grade teacher at Beaumont Middle School. Um, I am a learning center teacher, so I support across all uh, academic areas for middle schoolers. Um, I've been there for two years, and I, it is the fourth Spanish immersion school that I've worked in, which is nice. Um, so today I am going to be reading Gabby Lost and Found by Angela Cervantes. Um, this book is uh, a former OBOP book, in case any of you have participated in Oregon Battle of the Books. Um, Gabby is a sixth grade student, um, and she, her mom has been deported back to Honduras, and her mom is not able to get back into the United States, so she ends up um, staying with a dad that she's not very close with, um, but really being taken care of by her best friend and her best friend's family. Um, and she starts working through her school um, with a organization that's kind of like our Oregon Humane Society, so taking care of animals at the pound. Um, and she ends up falling in love with this cat in the story um, and connecting with it. And this is, and she steals the cat. Um, gets caught but ends up getting the cat given to her um, by the organization that she works for. Um, so a little bit about my background. I am um, raised in Oregon, born and raised in Oregon. Um, I, my dad is, uh, my dad's family is from Mexico. My mom's family um, came here um, in when my grandparents were younger um, from South Dakota, from a reservation in South Dakota. So um, I identify as Mexican American. Um, and I'm excited to do a reading with you guys. Okay, chapter one. A Siamese cat crouched on a tree branch, peering down at Gabby with brilliant blue eyes. It cried out. The cat was stuck in the tree in front of her house, and as luck would have it, she had on the nicest sweater she owned. Gabby pulled the cardigan sweater tighter around her. This was her last good school sweater until who knows when her father would have enough money to buy her a new one. The poor cat cried again. Gabby looks back at her small yellow house. If her mother was here, the cat would already be out of the tree and purring, safe and sound in her mother's arms. Mind made up, Gabby pulled off her sweater and tossed it onto her porch. You're out of luck, Gato, she yelled. My mom, master tree climber and cat rescuer, isn't back yet. She rolled up the sleeves of her white dress shirt. But until she is, you got me. Gabby grasped the nearest branch and pulled herself up. Gabby to the rescue, the cat meowed. Meow. I am hurrying. The last time Gabby had climbed the tree was when she and her best friend Alma had challenged the boys to a water balloon fight last summer. Up high was the perfect spot for a full-blown assault on the boys below. Those guys never had a chance. Gabby secured her feet and hands and climbed higher until the cat was within arm's reach. See, you weren't the only one who can climb. But then she looked down. Mistake number one. She knew that the universal rule of tree climbing said don't ever, ever look down. But she couldn't help it. This was the highest she'd ever climbed. If she fell, she'd definitely end up looking like an Egyptian mummy. Gabby imagined herself bandaged from head to toe and sipping the dinner through a straw. Well, she'd just have to not fall. Simple as that. Here, kitty, kitty, she called out, the same way she had heard her mom call for stray cats hundreds of times. But this was no stray. The cat was too shiny, too chubby. Around its neck, a rhinestone collar with gold charms sparkled. Someone loved the cat. She reached out toward it. Almost got you. Mistake number two. The cat arched its back and hissed. Gabby pulled back, startled. <gasps> nice teeth. She resettled on the branch, considering her options. When Gabby was younger, she had seen her mom climb the same tree many times to rescue a cat. All the way up, her mom had giggled a sweet talk to the cat in Spanish. Que bonita, you're so pretty little cat. Her mom told her when dealing with cats, you should speak softly and pick them up by the loose skin on the back of their necks because that's how their mothers carried them. Her mom had always made it look so easy. Once 
she had the cat nestled against her chest, she would maneuver down through the branches, comforting the cat with kisses on the ears and soft words with rolling Spanish R's like purrs. There were never any arched backed hisses or sharp teeth. Gabby took a deep breath and reached out for the cat again. It's okay, little kitty, she said sweetly. This time, the cat latched onto her, digging its claws into her arm and shoulder. Ouch, ouch! She couldn't quite get it by the scruff of the neck like her mom had shown her, but at least she had the animal. That was progress. Now she just had to get down without falling. She held onto the cat and with one free hand made her way down the tree branches, branch by branch. She was halfway down when a loud, brash voice broke her concentration. Gabby, what are you doing up there? Alma hollered. Taking a nap, Gabby shouted back careful to keep a tight grip on the tree and the cat. Be careful, I'm always, Gabby's foot slipped, but she quickly regained her foothold. Careful, a faint squeak of metal signaled Marcos and Enrique pulling up on their bikes. Both of them were wearing their usual long white t-shirts and baggy basketball shorts. Between the branches, Gabby saw Enrique point up at her. Marcos flung his head of dark hair back and laughed and clapped as if whatever Enrique had said was the funniest thing he'd ever heard. They were probably making a joke about her falling on her butt. We're almost there, kitty, she crooned. Finally, she swung her leg over the lowest branch and jumped down. The cat leaped out of her arms with a screech. You're welcome, Gabby yelled at the cat as the cat scurried down the street. She inspected her shirt and her pants. Her clothes were still intact but her shoulders ached and her arm was covered in red welts. Alma pulled a leaf out of Gabby's wavy brown hair. Not very grateful, is she? That's Mrs. Spolveda's cat, Enrique said. He leaned his bike against the tree. Whenever she opens her front door, the cat takes off. One time she gave me $5 to get it down from her roof. It almost ended, with my, basket ended my basketball career. Tall and skinny in an athletic way, Enrique played all the sports, but basketball was his favorite. He held the neighborhood re record for most games of horse won. I still have all the scars. He stuck out his long arms and twisted it to search his scabby elbow for the old wounds. Hey, watch this, Marcos yelled from across the street. He showed off a no-hand wheelie on his red and silver lowrider bike and then jumped the curb. He stopped a few inches from the girls. Bazam! In your face! Gabby yawned. <sighs> Alma closed her eyes and snored. <sighs> That's cool, Marco said. He got off his bike and walked it over to the porch. I'll remember you both when I'm in Las Vegas performing Daredevil stunts for millions of dollars. Millions, I can see your stunts for free on YouTube. Alma shook her dark curls. If I were you, I'd stick to palm reading. Now there's a trick that won't paralyze you from the neck down. Gabby laughed and gave her a high five. When Marcos wasn't doing wheelies on his bike, he believed he could see the future in the thin splintered lines of the palm. He studied his bike against Gabby's porch and sat down on the steps. I know you only say this because you care. He brushed back a swatch of black hair from his hazel eyes and flashed both girls a smile. Speaking of palm readings, anyone want one? I need the practice. Anyone? Alma busied herself with rewrapping her purple scarf around her neck and hummed. Enrique stared off into the tree as if it had suddenly spoken to him. Okay, okay. Gabby grabbed her sweater, tied it around her waist, and sat next to Marcos but I don't wanna hear that I'm going to die before the age of 30 from a heart attack, like you tell everyone. Even though Marcos and Enrique were a year older than the girls, all four had been friends since they had training wheels on their bikes. As long as they could remember, Marcos had boosted that he was gifted with the power of palm reading. Some women in the neighborhood even paid him to read their palms. Tell me what we'll be doing for our next sixth grade service project. I'm a palm reader, not a psychic. Marcos took Gabby's hand. Still, I might be able to help you. What are your choices? 
an animal shelter or the city harvest center? Gabby answered. Both are lame. Emma rolled her eyes. Working with animals would be fun, Gabby shrugged. That would be better than the city harvest center. Totally, Alma nodded. Gabby passed her a slight smile. Ever since Gabby's mom was deported and her father had moved back into the house to care for her, money had been tight. Everyone in the neighborhood knew that Gabby and her father were struggling, but only Alma knew that twice a month they went to the city harvest center to pick up food. What you got against free food for poor people? Marcos chided. Nothing. It's just, it's just I. Gabby stammered. She went on a first name base. She was on a first name basis with the staff at the city center harvest, at the har city harvest center. The minute she walked in the door, it was, "Hey, Gabby, what's up?" At the center, she and her father picked up boxes filled with canned tuna, peanut butter, spaghetti, and toilet paper. Sometimes, if the center had a special donation of cookies, they'd throw an extra for Gabby. She never had the heart to tell them that she didn't like sweets. She always took the extra cookies with a big smile and said thanks at least a hundred times before she left. Gabby was grateful for the Harvest Center. She just didn't want to go there with her classmates. I'd rather take care of the animals, that's all. Hmm, the food pantry or an animal shelter, you say? Marcos narrowed his hazel eyes and traced a line on Gabby's palm with his finger. Suddenly, he lifted her hand to his nose. I smell kitty poop. Gabby yanked her hand away while he and Enrique laughed. You're ridiculous. Gabby glared at Marcos. My uncle Junior and me took a box of puppies to a shelter once, Enrique said. We found them by the Parkway Bridge. You know where the sign is that says no dumping. Why do people do that? It's dangerous with all the cars and the woods. Gabby shook her head. My uncle says it's because people think that the animals will like living there. There's lots of birds, snakes, and mice to hunt, Enrique said. Or maybe they don't know about your house, Marcos pointed to the small white saucer on the bottom step. When Gabby's mom had lived at home, she filled the saucer with food for the strays. Sometimes it was leftover chicken from the evening's dinner. Other time, it was slices of sandwich meat or oatmeal, anything she could spare, which wasn't a lot, but her mom always managed to find something. And Amales depend on us to take care of them, she'd always tell Gabby. Every night, stray cats and dogs showed up on the porch as if a secret animal network had spread the word about the nice woman in the yellow house who feeds the strays. One night, when Gabby's father still lived with them, he ran a skinny gray cat away from the porch. Her mom was heartbroken. It was the first time Gabby had heard her mom raise her voice to her father. It's easy, Parati, to scare them off, but I've been that cat, she said. I know how it feels to be the one looking for food and a safe place. Gabby hadn't known what her mother meant at the time, but later her mother told her about the many nights she'd slept outside and traveled on an empty stomach from her home country of Honduras to reach the United States. That night, after cleaning the scratches on her arm, Gabby filled the small saucer on her porch with milk. It was all she had to spare. She checked the dining room table for a note from her father. It was covered with bills and newspapers, but nothing from him letting her know what time he'd be home. As usual, she made her bed on the couch, keeping the cordless phone next to her. She finally fell asleep. She dreamed that it was a knock at the door. Her mom called to her. Gabby, it's me. I don't have my key. Please let me in, she said. In her dream, Gabby jumped from the couch and opened the door, but her mother wasn't there. Instead, the Siamese cat she'd rescued earlier gazed up at her. She'd recognize those blue eyes anywhere. When Gabby bent down to pick the cat up, it swiped her face with its claws. Gabby cried out. Ah! She woke. Gasp, grasping her cheek. Through the dark, she looked toward the front door. It was closed. No cat, no mom. Then she heard her father's voice. She sat up and saw him hunched over the dining room table with his back to her. She felt around for the cordless, but it was gone. Her father was whispering to someone on the phone. He mumbled something about money and about not wanting to risk something. Dad, who are you talking to? 
Go to sleep, Gabby. It's late. Is it mom? He quickly whispered goodbye to the caller and hung up. Dad, don't worry about it. Go to sleep. He stood up, went to his room, and closed the door behind him. Gabby got up, grabbed the phone from the table, and tucked it under her pillow. All right, we're going to read the next chapter, chapter two. Gabby almost tripped over her own feet as she and Alma slid into Mrs. Kohler's classroom. The school bell rang. It was Gabby's fault that she and Alma were almost late. Every morning for the last three months, she'd woken up tired. If it wasn't a bad dream about her mom that interrupted her sleep, it was her father coming home late. No matter how quiet he attempted to be, Gabby would hear him unlock the door, tiptoe past the couch, and close the door to his bedroom. And then there were the times, too many to count, that he'd bump into the dining room table or stub a toe in the dark and let out a painful series of curses. Serious curse words that if repeated at St. Anne's would be grounds for expulsion. Still, last night was different. All night she wondered who her father had been talking to and why he was being so secretive. If it was her mom, why didn't he just say so? By the time she'd finally fallen asleep, it was the morning. Gabby was still getting dressed when Alma's dad and Alma pulled up in their car to take her to school like they did every day. Thanks to Alma's father's precision driving, the girls made it to class on time, barely. Mrs. Kohler frowned as they took their seats. One more minute and you two would have been missed the vote for our community project. Once the bell rang, Mrs. Kohler did not allow any late students into the classroom. Sorry, Mrs. Kohler, Gabby said and then yawned. <sighs> if she slept in her bedroom, Gabby would sleep better, but it wasn't an option. Ever since her mom had been deported to Honduras, Gabby had a reoccurring dream that her mom was knocking at the front door. It was just a dream, but Gabby didn't want to be tucked away in her bedroom, where she couldn't hear her mom at the front door when she finally returned. Gabby leaned toward Alma. My dad is keeping something from me. Why am I not surprised? I know, Gabby frowned. Last night, I woke up and heard him on the phone. He said something about money, and not taking the risk again, or something like that. Was he talking to your mom? I thought about that, but then... Gabby looked toward the front of the classroom. Miss Kohler was writing on the board. They never talked to each other. She's still mad that he moved in after she left. She wanted me to stay with your family, you know, not with him. Alma nodded. My mom and dad are still upset about that too. She only talks to him if she absolutely has to. She's not all of a sudden going to have a secret middle of the night conversation with him, ever. He must be up to something. Alma tapped her fingers across her lips. Exactly, Gabby pounded the desk with her hand. Mrs. Kohler cleared her throat <clears throat> and gave Gabby and Alma a warning stare. The stare was part raised eyebrow and part pursed lips. Gabby was sure that all the teachers learned it their first year at St. Anne's from Sister Joan, principal and master of the warning stare. The girls quieted. Alma gave Gabby a quick wink. When Mrs. Kohler finally looked away, Alma enjoyed being the rebel, even though she wore the same school uniform of khaki, a white collared shirt, and navy blue cardigan as everyone else. In fourth grade, it was cowboy boots. The nuns at St. Anne's quickly put a stop to that. Last year, it was a long gold necklace. The nuns had a fit. This year, she wore a purple scarf around her neck. Even though the St. Anne's official school unicolor colors were navy blue and gold, so far, the nuns had not objected. Gabby was grateful for the school uniform, even the stiff khaki pants. No matter how many times her father quit or lost a job, no matter how many times her, uh, she, looked, she still looked like all the other girls. So what if her shoes were from Salvation Army store or her white shirt was paper thin and missing buttons. The cardigan sweater covered it. We will now vote to decide between two projects, Miss Kohler said. She floated around the room of desks, handing out a paper about community service. Our first option is the Furry Friends Animal Shelter, and our second is the City Harvest Center. All the girls cheered. Gabby bit her lower lip. 
Were her classmates applauding for the food pantry or the animal shelter? She hoped it was for the animal shelter. It was bad enough that Gabby's classmates made sad puppy dog faces whenever someone mentioned illegal immigrant during social studies or religion class. If they went to the city harvest center, her classmates would know that she was so poor, she depended on food boxes of free food. This was not good. It wouldn't take long for that scoop of juicy news to get around the whole school. Three months ago, the factory her mom worked at was raided and all of the workers who could not show legal papers were hauled away. The story dominated the local news. Undocumented workers like her mom were held for weeks and then sent back to their home countries. It didn't matter to the immigration agents that her mom shouldn't have even been at work that day. It had been her day off, but she was covering a shift for a coworker who had a sick baby, and it didn't matter to some of her classmates. Her mother's arrest and deportation was hot gossip. No one cared that Gabby's life was falling apart. It made her not want to return to St. Anne's, but she had no choice. There wasn't any money to buy Gabby a ticket to Honduras. Plus, Gabby had been born in the United States. She didn't know Honduras. Still, the risk of moving to a new country had seemed easy at the time compared to the stares and whispers she faced at school. The City Harvest Center would be the same thing all over again. Even with Alma blocking the blows, once gossipy eighth graders like Dolores and Jan got started, the teasing would be unbearable. She could see it now. Dolores would stop her in the hallway and snidely ask, did you pick up your box from the center this month? Maybe Dolores and Jan would leave canned food at her locker, just as they had left pictures of Martian aliens taped to her locker months before. Gabby shuddered. Let's take a vote, Mrs. Kohler said. Gabby tapped Alma's arm. I'm voting for the sweet little dogs and cats, said the girl with the sweet little scratches. Alma smirked. It's not that bad. Gabby rubbed her arms. Besides, I'd happily save the cat again. Not me. Emma shook her head. There are enough claws out with Dolores around. I don't need more. Gabby lowered her head. I can't go to the harvest center. I just can't. Emma gave her a knowing, sympathetic smile. Don't worry. I got this. She stood up. Mrs. Kohler and dear classmates. I would like to say that we should go to the Furry Friends Animal Shelter because even though I may not be a fan of stinky dog poop, the classroom filled with giggles, or itchy cat hair, I happen to know there are many animal lovers in this class. Thank you, Alma, Mrs. Kohler said. Alma remained standing. Is there something else? Well, she offered, the animal shelter would be something different for us. Very good, Emma, but you do realize no one is contesting the animal shelter. Oh, well, then I guess it makes no sense to mention that the eighth graders have to clean up a park for their community project, and the seventh graders are collecting pop cans. We have a chance to play with puppies. Puppies! Think about it, chicas. Let's stick it to the seventh and eighth graders and Emma Gomez, Mrs. Kohler interrupted. I think you've made your point. So when the class voted, Gabby and Alma along with the entire class, raised their hands in support of Furry Friends Animal Shelter. Gabby smiled at her best friend, relieved. Marcos was right, Alma. He predicted we'd go to the shelter. Yeah, itchy, scratchy cat hair all over our clothes. Here we come. Alma brushed invisible cat hair off her purple scarf. All right, we have time to read chapter three. Furry Friends Animal Shelter was located in a part of Kansas City that neither Gabby nor Alma knew. Fancy schmancy, Gabby nudged Alma. That's the fifth slug bug I've seen. I've counted two yoga studios and four coffee shops, Alma said. When the school bus pulled up to the shelter, all the girls hopped out and pressed down their school shirts. A tall, lanky man dressed in blue jeans and a black Star Wars t-shirt emerged from the building. Welcome, he yelped, striding down the sidewalk toward them. As he approached, his hands flew over his head like he was on a roller coaster. Welcome to Furry Friends. Gabby couldn't take her eyes off him. If he had a tail, it'd be wagging, she whispered to Alma. He had a long ponytail of black hair, 
thick dark eyebrows that hovered over brown eyes and a goatee. Both his arms were covered with colorful tattoos and silver studs sparkled from one earlobe. Gabby liked him at once. I'm not sure whether I should shake his hand or put a leash on him, Alma said. Hi, Dr. Velibos. I am Mrs. Kohler, and these students are the brightest in our school. Mrs. Kohler's tiny hands gestured toward the girls. The tall man, who looked younger and cooler than any Dr. Gabby had ever met, scratched his chin and took a long look at him. That's phenomenal. Good afternoon, sixth graders. I'm Dr. V, and you young ladies ready, are you young ladies ready to meet some furry friends? The girls answered yes, but apparently not loudly enough for him. He howled, are you ready to meet some furry friends? Yes, Miss Kohlers nodded at the girls and they screamed, yes, at the top of their lungs. Right on, let's go. He punched the air with his fist and led them to the lobby. He stopped at the front desk where an older woman with red hair and black rimmed glasses sat shuffling through papers. Daisy, these are all volunteers from St. Anne's. Everyone, this is the lovely Daisy, shelter director. Gabby liked how Daisy wore her long hair at the nape of her neck like an orange roll without frosting. Daisy gave them a thumbs up. Glad to have you ladies here. The students followed Dr. V into a large room where dozens of dogs of every size and breed jumped and barked and yelped in their cages. He placed his hands like a bullhorn around his mouth and yelled over the ruckus. Aren't they fantastic? Alma covered her ears with her hands and Gabby chuckled. Beware, the next room, it's full of fluffy kittens and cool cats that will steal your hearts with one meow. Walking from the dog room to the cat room was like the rainbow after a thunderstorm. The room was painted turquoise blue, hot pink scratching posts, yellow pillows, and balls of yarn of every color were lined up on high shelves. An assortment of stuffed toy rats and mice lay defeated on the tiled floor looking like they had, had seen better days. A couple of cats lounging near a large window looked back at the girls and yawned. Kittens stuck their paws out of the cages and meowed as the girls moved from one cage to another squealing. Look at this kitty, Oh, this one is so cute. Dr. Velibos opened a cage. Go ahead, hold them. Human contact is important to help shelter pets become sociable and more adoptable. Gabby didn't hesitate. She took a small yellow kitten named Lemon out of its cage. She ran her hand over its soft back. Poor thing, I bet it hates being caged up. Just then, the kitten clapped its small paws around Gabby's ponytail as if it had caught a snake. Gabby winced as it pulled and chewed her hair. Ah, ouch, it won't let go. Gabby cried out. Alma worked fast to detach the claws, the cat's claws and tiny teeth from Gabby's thick brown hair. When she got the two separated, she returned them into its cage. What was that you were saying about the poor thing? Alma grinned. Not funny. Gabby smoothed down her hair and patted. Dr. Velibos motioned for the girls to follow him into the vet clinic. Once inside the clinic, he pulled a skinny cat out of a cage. The cat was like no cat Gabby had ever seen. She was gray, tan, and white, with black stripes that streamed from her forehead down her back. Above the cat's bright green eyes was a dark M. It was a sign of a true tabby. Gabby was sure the M stood for marvelous, magical, magnificent. The cat cried out, Meow! Shh, it's all right. Dr. Villalobos swayed with the cat like a feather, soothing a fussing baby. This is a feather. Who wants to hold her? Gabby hand flew up. Alma, Alma gave her an incredulous look. Gabby wasn't having much luck with cats lately. The stray from yesterday had left her with red welts and a bad dream. Lemon had just tried to eat her hair. Still, she couldn't resist. Dr. Villalobos passed feather to Gabby. She was stunned by how light the cat was. She glided her hand over its fur and the cat's ribs poked out like handlebars on Micro's bike. Why is she so skinny, Gabby asked. Feather was abandoned at a rest stop. I named her Feather 
because she came in, she was light as a feather. If you can believe it, she's actually gained weight. Someone just abandoned her, Gabby said. The cat purred deep and low against her chest. Dr. Villalobos nodded. The highway patrol said she was sitting at a picnic table as if she was waiting for someone. She's also declawed, which means she was definitely someone's pet. He took Feather from Gabby and showed the girl Feather's claws, or clawless front paws. The cat let out a soft meow and reached back toward Gabby. Gabby's heart jumped. All the girls sighed. Aww. Wow, she likes you, Dr. Villabos said. He put Feather back into her cage. You two can visit later. Right now, it's time to play outside with the wolves. While her classmates swarmed past her to head outside, Gabby stopped at the doorway and looked back at Feather. The small cat locked eyes with her and meowed. Meow. I'll be back, Gabby answered. The shelter's backyard was lined with the large pine trees and along one side of the yard, there was a number of large pins that held two dogs each. The dogs jumped wildly. Their barking became louder and louder when Daisy brought out a few dogs from inside the shelter. Dr. Villalobos explained the playtime rules and instructed the girls to dispose of dog droppings poop, in a specific trash can. I knew it. It was, this is going to get bad, Alma said. She wrinkled her nose. Dr. Villalobos, she shouted, what if the poop is slimy and we can't pick it up? He even chuckled. A white tooth grin took over his face. Alma pressed on. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, that slimy poop can be a, quite a sticky situation. In that case, you should grab the big shovel over there and scoop it up. And please let us know because that's a sign the dog is sick or has dietary issues and we need to fix that. Gabby elbowed Alma. I know what we can do. Quick, let's make friends with small dogs because their stuff will be, you know, smaller. The girls spotted a small black and white terrier. The dog was chewing on a stuffed purple bear. Hmm, he seemed harmless, Alma said. The terrier looked up at her with wet brown eyes. Don't look at me like that, she snapped. You're cute, but you're not that cute. She sat down on the grass, grabbed the stuffed toy, and began a game of tug of war with the dog. The feisty terrier jerked the stuffed toy and Alma from left to right. The dog growled and Alma grunted. I think you've met your match, Gabby giggled. So what do you think about this place? Cool, but I'd like to take care of the sick animals too. Gabby looked toward the clinic, like Feather. Daisy and Dr. Vilbos were at the cl clinic entrance, deep in conversation. Whatever they were discussing, May Daisy drop her shoulders and Dr. Velibos lower and shake his head. Gabby hoped whatever it was had nothing to do with Feather. All right. That concludes our reading of Gabby Lost and Found. Um, we stopped at chapter four. If you are interested in this book, you can always go online and check it out um, from your school. Or you could also go and check it out at the Multnomah County Library. Even though they are not open for walk-in, you can still pick up books um, and, and check them out. Okay, good luck.